We'd rather do fewer partnerships that scale significantly than kind of plant a thousand seeds and you know be okay you know writing some off because to the earlier point it does take a lot of calories to do the first transaction with Intel. And are you worried at all about again their ability to I mean obviously Bank of America is not a small organization. Do you worry about their ability to scale up uh, quickly if, if, if you're going with fewer partners and so forth? Well, we I mean we have a vetting process where I mean you you have to be so tall to get on this ride and you know. <laughs> There has to be something about believing you can make a partner better as you go also. But it does sound like both of you, it's not like, wow, this, this company has an amazing issue or amazing product. It, you, your first step is what do we need internally and what, what do we need for our customers? It's not the bright, shiny object. That might go for the Virgin Banking platform or something like that but for, for the bank's own use. It's more about when you start with the proposition of what do we need. I think it's also a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you find a um, use case that solves a problem, then your ability to scale it um, becomes a lot easier. And then I think it was also um, a lot of fintech partnerships and, and that muscle within the organization um, kind of, you know, it builds kind of that internal employee confidence and engagement, which I think is incredibly important uh, as, as we talk about the war on talent, right? Is to, is to find those use cases that you can build and scale um, and then be able to build that playbook within the organization. And you know, I, I know there are a lot of large banks represented here. Um, the one thing I will share is even between lines of business, sometimes you see that different lines of business have different fintech uh, partnership playbooks as well, uh, which I thought was very interesting when I you know previously worked at a larger bank and then came to a little bit of a um, you know TD is not you know relatively smaller, but um, but you know it was interesting to see that um, sometimes multiple. Uh, LOBs have different, or lines of businesses have different approaches to fintech partnerships as well. And you make the internal versus external call pretty early in the game, or do you, do you do a search first to see if there's an external partner available, or do you do you judge internal first? Or does we tend to validate that the problem is worth solving, right? And that if we did it, it would be worthwhile. And then we do the massive spreadsheet that says looks good. Um, and by the way, looks good might not be just dollars wise. It could be digital engagement or retention or lots of other things um, before we would go to the build by partner. Gotcha. Great. So then, in addition to being partners these days, obviously, uh, FinTech is also many times clients of institutions. Uh, it, obviously, PayPal, and as we've talked about before, uh, or in this morning session, you know, it's not clear to a lot of millennials potentially is that there's actually a bank behind many, many of these products at the end of the day. Kevin's shaking his hand, he'll be getting on this in a moment. But then, <laughs> then, 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 then the, the, the possible issues with that issue. But the, the uh, but that there's a bank kind of standing behind all this somewhere somewhere in the background. And I and for for the for PayPal, uh, is, is there um, do you view it differently? I mean, what kind of banks do you actually view as clients? What type of kinds do you take on as clients or did you take on as clients? And and does it complicate a partnership arrangement if, you have, if you're both a client and a partner? Yeah, I, I don't know that it complicates the partnership or complicates the arrangement. I think it complicates my life in terms of which of my executives get calls from who with which banks. Um, so the fact that I buy treasury services from a bunch of different US banks, the fact that I buy processing services, merchant services, uh, the fact that we do a lot of uh, no money exchanging hands kind of partnerships like digital wallet provisioning and paper boards. Like we don't exchange money when we do that stuff, right? We're doing that for the betterment of our shared customers. Um, and then I'll sell some things back to some bank customers. So what it does is it, is it complicates my life. <laughs> but all those things are, are relatively well-established models, right? Like everybody has to buy services. Everybody tries to sell services. The one in the middle is probably the, the fuzzier one. Um, I, I certainly have, have tried to use it to my advantage in the past. I can say things now since I'm not. I've tried to use things to my advantage in the past in negotiating terms on treasury services or something like that. Um, but honestly, the banks are quite good at saying no thank you. Uh, those are different business lines and you know, we don't accept your value uh, trade. Um, but I, what, what, I do, what I do think is true is that it does create a, a more consistent environment of Right? When I have stronger ties with a financial institution, I can have um, more candid conversations 
about what we think needs to be better, what they think really needs to be better, and we can find mutual places of value to go get those things done where we might not have been able to do that without the rest of those relationships. And, and is there a particular like metrics that you look at? Is it the size of the bank? Is there certain qualities of the bank or something you look you know, at? Uh, that's a great question. When it comes to buying the services, I'm a pretty standard buyer, right? Like I want a great price, uh, basically a pass-through rate. I want the best uptime you can offer me, you know, five nines. Um, you know, I, as, a, as a buyer, I'm, I'm probably your worst customer. <laughs> um, you know, as a, as a mutual, Partner, though somebody trying to create mutual value across shared customers, that's a that's a far more interesting conversation about metrics and key performance indicators because it's really about where we find value and where the bank finds value. Luckily, in a lot of the things that we do successfully, there's there's actually a really heavy overlap, right? When it comes to digital wallet provisioning, I want a lot of users, and the banks want top of wallet position in PayPal because that's good spend for them, that's good lifetime customer value. When it comes to paying with rewards, I want lots of volume because that helps my margins, right? Because that's basically a free transaction and banks want that off of their books. They don't want that liability for those rewards anymore. So we, we find these places where we can measure things that we all care about and we make sure that those things are performing with their standards. That's great. And for the banks, I mean, again, obviously I assume you wouldn't mind having, you know, people who might have PayPal as a client and so forth. But I mean, how do you think about banks as, uh, you know, FinTech as clients? What kind of things do you look at? What kind of, you know, what kind of judgments do you make about whether having them as a client as well as a service provider? Yeah, I think it's, um, there's so many flavors of um, what kinds of FinTech partnerships would eventually result in a client-bank relationship. And I think, um, just to give you an example, you know, we may have, um, you know, just a referral arrangement with the company because we only want to test and learn um, the, the feature functionality, see if there's an appetite for it. Now, would we go after the banking relationship in a very wholesome way? Probably not. Um, there is a sweet spot, however, where you have a, you know, a significant relationship from a commercial and product offering standpoint. There are synergies because you have gone through the entire due diligence of onboarding them as a vendor to the bank. Uh, which creates some efficiencies if you're looking at, you know, onboarding them as a client to the bank. Um, and then obviously you, you also want to factor in the, the payment processing for your own customers on your own rails, which, you know, sometimes uh, is not immaterial. Um, and so I think there is a sweet spot there that I think, you know, when you, when you can um, make it work, it, I think it works for the benefit of the fintech as well as the bank. Um, and then, like I said, they're kind of, and there's everything in between. Um, that exists. So um, it, it really depends on the use case and nature of the relationship and what you're really trying to accomplish from a banking perspective with, with that company. Yeah. Yeah, I would add that I think um, PayPal is an example. Like a lot of the work that, that we've done kind of falls in two different buckets. One being what's great for their merchants should be great for our consumers, whether that be authorization rates in whatever way they choose to pay, whether it be um, claims, whether it be fraud. So usually working as a partnership to ch exchange more data that might come in the transaction to lead to learnings and investigations and trying to make those relationships stronger um, is, a, is a really valuable asset. And I think that's the difference between like a, a, a referral or a vendor and a partner. Um, so that's worked well. I think the other example I'll use from PayPal is um, one little press release like PayPal's gonna offer crypto Right, and multiple <laughs> floors in our business. Four Kevin Sanders. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, being able to. It's that nervous switch you got there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but being able to, to go to the right level of, in the organization, right, between PayPal and ours, saying we need to structure a little review here. We want to know how <laughs> this is going to work, and if our clients' wallet is going to fund it, how will that work? How will it get classified, et cetera? And then the Treasury Bank needed to know, like, there's no. Uh, transferring these different crypto um, assets. So I, I found that that was a very efficient and effective way to get some answers and then monitor it and kind of spot check it periodically, which which was really great. And just one other question. You, you talk about different types of partnerships, investments, and so do you, do you also make, is there some rationale as to why you might acquire the whole company versus a minority investment for, you know, it, does it matter? I mean, do you think about things in different ways or do you, it, does it, you're going to make the investment to your not. I, I think the, the concept of making a strategic investment in a company that you are partnering with um, does hold merit. Of course, you know you want to 
be at the forefront of continuing um, kind of product evolution that the company is making and sometimes having an observer board seat um, in those organizations gives you a front row seat into the roadmap, the prioritization. Um, there are obviously caps around kind of, you know, what is the amount of investment that, that, uh, that you are able to make. But I have found that having, um, in early stage startups, having a strategic investment in the company um, sometimes does prove to be valuable um, in maintaining the relationship as well as, um, you know, uh, ensuring that you kind of have that front row seat. Um, I think the question of buying a fintech um, kind of comes with its own set of uh, paradigms. There's obviously a, a, a why. Is it talent? Is it IP? Is it, you know, kind of uh, time to market on certain capabilities? Um, and that needs to be kind of factored in on the on the rationale to buy. Um, I would say, like, uh, I, I always find the buy concept to, to be one that takes a lot longer um, sometimes. Uh, or, you know, uh, the rationale sometimes is, say, we just think this is an adjacent service that's complementary of our own capabilities and that results in, uh, in an acquisition. So, again, just so, so many uh, reasons and um, you know, rationale that goes into whether you partner and make a strategic investment in the company or you actually decide to, uh, to acquire it. Yeah, we haven't been very inquisitive for a while. You know, we have, I think, done one acquisition in the last two years. Um, we will take small stakes in, in companies that we're going to go to market with and embed in our solutions. Um, but I would say it's, it's more the exception than the rule. Um, and then, you know, periodically there are problems we want to solve or we'll be better off getting help. And the one acquisition was in the healthcare space for, uh, for card transactions and payment gateway. So there are things like that where there's so much specialization that it doesn't make sense to try to replicate it or build it. Um, but we, we don't have a, we don't acquire or invest, I think, quite as frequently as others. Okay. And it, yeah. Yeah, I was just. I, I got to do a little bit of this back when I was at Capital One, and it was it was a lot of fun. Bought WikiBuy, which turned into Capital One Shopping. Hopefully, everybody uses it because it's a fantastic service. Um, but <laughs> the thing you just lost your bank panelists. That was right. um, the thing. The thing that I, I want all of my bank friends to to fully appreciate and understand is like the real value in a fintech is that they are so myopically focused on solving a specific problem that they have either definitely figured out how to do it, which is why you're talking to them in the first place, or they've definitely figured out how to not, right? And so either way, you're learning something, but if they have definitely figured out how to do it, more likely than not, like acquiring them could be a path to get that in-house where it would take you a significantly longer amount of time to design and ideate so whether it's an aqua hire kind of thing or pure buy the service and stuff, like if it's if it's the thing, if it's truly the problem you're trying to solve, somebody who is so myopically focused on that instead of you being focused across the entirety of your client's uh, life cycle with you, like chances are pretty good they've solved it better than other people. So Kevin, turning to you, my friend, you've been very patient uh, and listening a lot. I mean, how does the how does the OCC uh, view bank and fit, any hot buttons to think about? How does, how does sure. the OCC think about these things? No, and being the sole regulator on the panel, I know everyone's expecting me to rain on the parade. <laughs> and if you were curious, I did bring a ring with me from DC. <laughs> but no, I, we we have been very vocal, along with many of our other regulatory agencies, of being very supportive of responsible innovation in banking. Many of these fintech and these partnerships with fintechs provide opportunities to provide efficiencies for the bank, provide products and service to help customers manage their financial health, as well as the potential to increase inclusion in the banking system by better offering products and services to the underbanked, underserved um, segments uh, of society, and really do have an opportunity to improve the overall experience for all stakeholders. That, that being said, responsible innovation, and one of the things that we're very closely watching is development of these partnerships and understanding what are the implications, as well as very focused on is there clear transparency or delivery of the banking service? Because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a credit service, it's a deposit service, it's a payment service, it's a custody, but it's a banking service we're talking about 
and there's clear, it is their clear transparency in how that is being delivered, who is responsible for the different elements of that delivery, the risk management and controls, and always remembering that if it's a bank product and service, the bank ultimately needs to be sure and is responsible for the risk of the services that they're providing. So, so to be clear, when you say transparency, do you mean transparency to the customer, to the OCC, to both? To, to I think I think both as well as transparency for the financial institution itself that they understand how the service is being delivered because that fintech you're partnering with may be working with several other tech firms <coughs> or organizations to deliver that service. So having that understanding, understanding what the product being delivered to the end customer is, how that risk is being managed, and what effective controls are in place from both safety and soundness, compliance and consumer protection are going to be very important. One of the things working in this area and looking at the development of FinTech beginning back in 2015 for myself, it's been going on long before that. But, um, Understanding that transparency and looking back to other uh, downturns or impacts in the banking sector, lack of transparency or one of the under is a common underlying root cause. So as banks and fintechs partner, again, it's providing great opportunity, but having that transparency and understanding of the delivery of the banking service and that the risk management and controls are in place are going to be very important. And the one thing I've clearly been um, observing just in my short time focused in this area is the increasing complexity, interconnectedness, and the speed of change is very different than when you saw innovation back in the early 2000s with the internet, going back to ATMs and automated processing. Um, so that's something also to be very focused on because the change is occurring and the adoption of these new products and services much more quickly than we've seen in previous decades. And, and you've talked about the products and so forth. Does it matter what type of product is being offered, whether it's a deposit product or a lending product or something like that? I mean, do you look at different products differently uh, and what the responsibilities are? From To the extent that the controls may differ between a credit product, a deposit product, a custody product, um, so really the fundamentals don't change for effective credit risk management, effective deposit liquidity management, custody. How that's delivered and where the controls are and who's actually providing that and having a clear understanding of who's contractually required to, to provide the, that risk management and those controls, but also doesn't matter who's contractually required, who's ultimately responsible for that that's in place. And that's going to be very important as banks continue to increase engagement and partnerships with FedTech organizations. Again, there's a lot of opportunity, but as with anything, there are risks that do need to be managed. Of course. So of course. Two, two examples of like litmus tests that we apply. One is what's the transparency of the data that a client is sharing with the FinTech and how that data is going to be used. Either in the like for a sole purpose or for other knock-on purposes. The second is around model risk management, and I won't go all payment nerd, but <laughs> effectively, you know, most of these companies are using uh, artificial intelligence, or they're using a lot of, you know, big data, and the way we're regulated, we have to know what's happening within those models for fair lending and all these other types of things. So our, that's like a, a key indicator for us about what could we control or how could we incorporate a third party's product or offering or decisioning into something that we offer. So I just use it to illustrate some of Kevin's points. No, and that, that's a good example because ultimately the FinTech or the third party can conduct a lot of that for you with their AAML solution, but your understanding of what are the fair lending implications because ultimately it's the financial institution or chartered bank that's providing that loan. It's that institution that's responsible for some of the fair for the for the fair lending implications uh, of how that loan service is delivered. And does it matter to you whether the bank is in the background? I mean, this is the model that Avery doing. I mean, whether the, the, the fintech is front running and the bank is somewhere in the background, and they, you know, customers only know the bank is there, or. If it's a bank product that's being kind of supported by, it's clear the bank's involved, it's just being supported by the FinTech. 
I think it's very important that the bank be aware of it can provide that service and it can be the fintech that's the front end of the, the delivery of that credit. But ultimately, if the bank is executing that loan and providing that loan to the um, customer, the bank does have a responsibility for understanding that. Now, how that risk is managed is going to be unique to the different relationship and again, the delivery of that service. But ultimately, we have laws, rules, and regulations for consumer protection when it comes to lending. That doesn't go away if they click on a FinTech app or if they walk into the back branch to get that loan. And, and again, you mentioned obviously transparency. You know, we talked a little about data privacy. Are there any other kind of lessons learned, things that you've seen that, that, got, that, that should have been addressed earlier on or things that, that I mean, to help navigate, obviously, as the world continues to move, we've heard, you know, that also just talk about rent and charter, so all these other things that are out there. Any thoughts about how the bank should be thinking about the hot buttons these days that you all are focused on or something like that? Sure, absolutely. I think one of the most important things is, again, to understand how that transaction is going to work and how that's going to be delivered, because ultimately we've seen different areas and we've seen a lot of success stories, but clearly there are institutions that have not had effective implementation and have seen where it can increase credit risk, it can increase liquidity risk, but also if that customer is harmed, the bank can ultimately be responsible from that, from some of the consumer protection laws, as fair as some of the unfair and deceptive practices um, requirements or rules that are out there that the banks really need to understand if it's your, if it's your charter that's providing that loan, understand what the risks are and how that and how that's operating because ultimately it's going to get traced back to it was National Bank of Main Street that provided the credit that resulted in this or ultimately held a deposit for the customer. So it's going to be very important because again from our focus we are looking there are a lot of different financial services that can be provided through these partnerships but banking services those are special. That, that's different and there's a reason why you need to have either a banking charter or some other financial license in order to provide those services. And Avery, do the, do the fintechs also focus on the make sure the banks are in compliance? Are they leave that large to the banks? Or how does that, how does that work for them? Yeah, I mean, we, we want to be sure we're, we're partnering with a solid partner for, for those things, right? Uh, a lot of that comes down to performance, as I mentioned earlier. A lot of it's price. Um, but the rest of it is how about them are you, right? Um, uh, you don't you don't want to get caught in a wire card situation. Right? Like that that's bad, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think there like, there are, are benchmarks, you know, the you have to be told a red eye joke from, from earlier, it's why I wear the hat. But I think the same the same goes a little bit <coughs> for, for banks too. I think one of the exceptions to that rule. Um, probably comes in the, the BAS space, the banking as a service space, because usually your larger banks are not going to be as interested in taking those things and then pushing them out as third party kind of platform offerings, right? And so you go, you go to a different place to get those kinds of services, or you might go to a different place in a specific geography where you're trying to get those kinds of services. And in that situation, you end up in a brand new vetting scenario Whereas you're not dealing with your existing relationships anymore, right? You're diving into new relationships. Or you're testing the waters on, on what the vitality of that geography has to offer. Um, but we do we do our due diligence as well because we are regulated as well. Like PayPal might be a bit unique when we talk about FinTechs, right? Like 23 years old, pretty mature, nearly a trillion and a half in volume. Like we move some money around every every once in a while. <laughs> The, the point is that because we are that big, right, we've, we've got to make sure that things are buttoned up um, and, and we're gonna use a, a certain caliber of service as a result. That's not necessarily true in every situation, right? You're, you're going to be more picky when you can be picky. Makes sense. So, so the other, speaking of unfair and deceptive practices and everything else, as you know, um, the CFPB, for example, has been Quite outspoken that it's going to focus on bank and fintech partnerships and use this 
1033 authority, the kind of dormant authority and so forth to kind of push things. Um, obviously for the banks, that creates a concern of kind of dueling regulators and, and that type of issue or are you being consistent. Are you, are there, are the, is the OCC and the others, to your knowledge, working with the CFPB to kind of develop like a common playbook? Are there, are there areas where they're kind of moving in, in a, where they're moving ahead, or moving in a different direction, or something like that, or, or do you see it all pretty well aligned? No, that there there is a lot of collaboration between the regulators, and we're very much looking forward to working with and supporting CFPB as they work through the 1033 language shadow rules. But um, we have multiple forms, whether for banking specific, we have the NFIC where those communications, conversations, and collaboration is occurring. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but I'm going to say, yeah, I'll tell you that we continue to see the need to collaborate very closely because of the increasing complexity of the operating environment in the financial sector. Um, we also have the FIBIC that is much broader and um, really focuses that bring together all the financial sector regulators, both um, federal as well as many of the state associations that represent the state both banking and securities regulators. So we do collaborate and work very much together. And I, I don't view it as a dueling do regulators as when the rules are set, those rules apply to all the banks or to all the financial service, depending on the authority of that regulator. So when the CFPB sets those rules, those, those are the rules. It's kind of like Homeland Security, right? Everybody knows the rules, they just enforce it. <laughs> I like that last I, I, I'd like to say no, no, but one of the things we do recognize, and there's a reason why the system's designed that way, is we do have different regulators with different focus, and each one is very important, whether it's prudential supervision uh, against the financial institutions, whether it's consumer protection, whether it's market and market fairness whether it's financial stability or a mix of those. So each regulator will have its, um, its mission and its focus, but we do try to, we do work together very closely, understanding that yes, it's not all going to be perfectly aligned even within a single agency, that's always uh, a challenge as well. But we are, again, communicating, working to develop common standards, common programs, either through the FFIC or through our collaboration with FIBIC, as well as if there are international organizations as well that we work with our foreign regulators. It's not perfect, but one of the things that we are increasingly, and you'll see more and more where when guidance comes out or when rules are written, they're written across multiple agencies where 10, 20 years ago, that might not have been the case. And that's because it is interconnected and it's very important that the regulators are working together. No one agency can do it, but by working together and keeping in, and keeping focus on our different missions, which each one is very important, our goal is to have a safe, sound, and inclusive financial system for the U.S. and for the U.S. citizens. But again, I, I think to the point, you obviously are prudential regulators, the OCC, yes. the Fed, the FDIC, the CFPB is obviously not prudential regulators, got a different focus. Eight, so they could be that the rule, you know, they could have to, you know, they could apply the same approaches, come up with different answers, come up with different approaches, or, or think, think to solve things in different ways. Let's put it that way. Think, think, think to solve, see to solve things in different ways. Is it, so if, if for the banks, for like a national bank, do they, I guess the theory is like a lowest common, what you, you kind of look at what both require to make sure you're, but did, did, can they turn to you for kind of a comprehensive kind of solution or do they look, do they look to both? How, how do they, how do you suggest they navigate this? Because obviously, particularly since the CFPB, again, I'm not saying rightfully or wrongfully is not publishing a lot of regulations, it's largely, you know, through enforcement actions and so forth, the acting, how, how can a bank navigate this, uh, a national bank navigate this going forward? Any thoughts on that? Sure, and I can speak for another regulator, I was gonna say, but from, from, from the OCC's perspective, again, there, there is a common set of rules. Um, again, CFPB, the, the federal banking agencies, 
um, where it's a state charter institution, state of bank, right, have a certain set of authorities to write certain rules, and those rules are applicable across those institutions. So when see those are the rules for national banks. That's that's, that's the, those are the rules for state for state member and non-member banks. That's that's how it works. Again, the collaboration as well as yes, they're coming in from different perspectives to ensure we have a comprehensive uh, federal framework. Consumer protection is a priority. Prudential standards are a priority. Financial stability are a priority. Working together, we are going to achieve that. Uh, again, we're always working to improve, and there always are challenges so when you're dealing with multiple organizations with, again, different missions, but at the end of the day, we're all going for the same end goal. And so I won't say, I'll tell you that there are going to be slight differences. I will tell you we are communicating regularly. There is one set of requirements, um, whether it's consumer protection led by one agency, prudential standards by um, another, holding company regulations by we are working all together to make sure we have a consistent framework. I won't say there won't be hiccups, but that is one of our goals, and that's something we're very focused on, is collaboration among the agencies. I mean, I have a question from the audience. Uh, just uh, any thoughts uh, on the EU antitrust investigation of Apple Pay as a wallet provider uh, on their products the exclusion of other payment providers and similar litigation on the U.S.? Just See if anybody has any thoughts on that. Just to throw out a name. Hey, Avery, any thoughts on that? I have opinions. Yeah, I, look, um, the problem of customer engagement, particularly consumer customer engagement, is that uh, the digital age has created centers of power, large concentrations of power. And when you have an entity, I don't care who it is, it could be Apple, it could be somebody else. When you have an entity that controls devices and services and walls, gardens, it, it, it allows them to put themselves into positions of strength that mean you cannot compete. You physically cannot compete. Um, and I would argue that if you were to further use that position of power to extract a dig on the volume that flows through that, like, <laughs> Whether it happens here in the U.S., who can say, right? Um, but I do, I do believe that in the end, regardless of antitrust lawsuits, regardless of who wins that nonsense or how it, how it yields at the end of the day, I do personally firmly believe that what wins will be uh, true reach and ubiquity of access. And so, unless I can actually get those services and those experiences across all the services and devices and channels that I want them, it's probably not going to be the winning factor, right? And so, what I would say is, at the end of the day, I think what we'll win out is true access to reach. Okay. Great. The product or an activity should be regulated in the same way. You kind of hear different versions of that, different stories. Um, Again, I guess to ask the bank panelists, do you see do, do you see this this strain between banks and fintechs from a competitive perspective, or, or how do you see that? I, I mean, I think that we look at it as ongoing competition, right? When we talk about fintechs and regulations, all we ask for is a fair playing ground, right? So that we're, there's no advantage to one or the other. I think that there's been a lot of uh, neo banks, like as a classification that have done a lot to drive like what matters most in user experience is that a lot of banks have wound up adopting some of those things. Um, but I, I do feel like the when it gets into lending and some of the other t areas, um, and you know, buy now, pay later is a big hotspot, that those are the types of things where what they're doing is unprecedented. There is no specific like, like layaway plans that are, you know, our parents' parents would have had, you know, is more similar. Um, so figuring out how to look at that thing, how to classify it, and how to be consistent about holding that up against, you know, standard credit line or other types of things, I think, is where that ambiguity creates a, a space where we're not sure what to, to do about. 
right? Do we replicate it? Do we think it's going to go away? Do we partner? So those are the things I think that inside our respective bank walls we wind up talking about more maybe than even just like I, the example of the new bank. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, just to kind of share from a small business commercial perspective, what, what we're starting to see is obviously companies or fintechs, and I, you know, could maybe count them on one hand, um, some of the larger ones that have actually started with the payment experience but almost built a bank around around it, right? So they started with merchant acceptance as an example, uh, but now offer you know checking accounts, offer debit card products. Um, and I think that's where you know you, you do start to and you know they have slick user experience, but to Rich's point, I think that's becoming pretty much table stakes. Um, and I think that's where you really start to kind of uh, wonder around what is the you know. What are the regulations that would be applicable to to entities like um, like those? Um, and you know, in all honesty, I think they have pretty large market share uh, within small businesses that traditionally work with large banks as well. So I think that's kind of the gray area that is evolving, which I think we're all kind of very closely watching. Um, I, you know, my personal opinion is a lot of uh, fintechs that I found to be successful are ones that have also built an infrastructure that works very collaboratively, collaboratively with banks. Um, and, and they're really in the service of, their customers are truly the banks who use those capabilities to go to market more effectively for the benefit of businesses and consumers. And I think that model, in my opinion, has been a lot more successful and, and works for both parties because the FinTech is bringing the technology and the innovation in some cases, and the bank is bringing the customer base. And the, and kind of the union of the two brings just a very powerful product to market, uh, but obviously that's um, you know that's not always the case. And so yes, there is definitely a segment of fintechs that I think are um, continuing to um, maybe they didn't start out as competition, maybe they started off with an accounting platform and now do uh, you know offer everything else. But uh, it, this this segment is evolving so quickly and so rapidly that. Uh, and everyone understands that the pre-unit economics are almost always more favorable when there's a payment or a financial capability tied to it. And I think that's what big techs, fintechs, in some cases, are, uh, are after. And Avery, this is an area that puts your, the strain between your old role and your new role at the highest, uh, highest level. But uh, do you have any particular thoughts on it, Avery? Yeah, I, you know, I, I go back to the idea that if you can solve a problem better, you deserve to win, right? And if I can solve a problem better, maybe I deserve to win. Rich, the same. If you're a bank or a fintech. If you're a bank or a fintech. I'm a bank or a fintech. Either one, either one. Uh, and and why, why not be both, right guys? Um, I, I think, I, I, do, I do think though at the end of the day that in almost, in almost all of those situations, there is still a financial institution backing that. The end of the day. Somebody is providing some kind of service to that fintech that's competing against some other bank, and they're making money on it as a result, right? Like, it just, yes, the ecosystem has become more complicated, more complex, more fractured and fragmented, and, and you know, things used to be linear and neat, and now they aren't anymore, and that is an absolutely axiomatic statement and a little tautological, but at the same time, uh, it's the conditions we find ourselves playing with, right? And so we need to play to the conditions a little bit, right? And so, um, you know, like if I have deposit products that aren't competitive, I should make a better deposit product. If Rich needs better treasury services, he should go build better treasury services, right? Like, like that's just the nature of competition. Um, but at the end of the day, if I'm going to do that as a fintech, Rich is probably there backing me, and I'm paying them some money to do it, right? Um, so I think uh, at, at, at the end of the day, I don't see a world in the near future, let's call it like a two to three year horizon, where you have the classic idea of fintech kind of operating without some kind of bank at Bible. Backing them in some capacity. Uh, I agree. I also think when you look at the stats, there's one fintech with a charter. It's Verabank, right? Revolut is the only other one that's continuing to press to get their own charter. And I think the two to three year horizon will help 
you know, kind of tell, like, what, what's the real differentiator? Because we're seeing a lot of banks start with the Bank Tor Corp Bank or MetaBank or Cross yeah. River or others. But as they get scale, they need a more, a, a more sizable yeah. liquidity provider. Yeah. Right. And that's when I think, you know, the controls and the partnerships kind of take a different turn. No, no, I, I was going to, there, there's a question we're not going to get to, but it's very pertinent to this discussion, and one of the questions was, does regulation provide a barrier, or create a barrier for innovation? And no, it, it does not. Regulation does provide a barrier to entry into the banking system, and those barriers are there for a very good reason, and to the comment about partner with a bank, there's a public trust associated with this. That's why there's rules and regulations, but also why there's insurance and oversight for these kinds of services. FinTechs provide a lot of opportunities and provide a lot of um, more capability, or in some cases, more capabilities for customers. But those protections don't go away. And going back to the conversation on transparency, it's important that works both ways. The banks understand transparent as to the end delivery of the service. The customers also need to understand how that's being delivered. And to the oversight model, that is going to become increasingly complex. Um, I know for the federal banking agencies, we, we look at significant third parties under the Bank Service Company Act authorities. But again, this is becoming even more increasingly complex. And that's what's going to be important going forward is understanding who are the delivery points and what are those existing rules and regulations that apply to that service and how is that being insured. And again, as this develops, do future changes need to be made to those rules and regulations or oversight models? But that transparency and that public trust is going to be very important with the delivery of any of these financial services. Great. Well, as Avery, I think you brought up the subject for FinTech 3.0 in two or three years from now, uh, our, our fine panel. I want to thank our panelists. I'm positive of the reception outside, so thank you very much. For